and I had to stay every night at five o'clock like this, listen to you people trying to win Hill number so much. It was all hills, and it was so, and we understood it, it was so difficult. They were fighting from hill to hill. We all see the same thing, whether it's a car accident or a, a concert or whatever, a little bit differently. And there were three episodes that happened to me in Cyprus, and all of them include, uh, uh, had to deal with death and dying. We lost our uncle in the First World War. His name was Fred Halliday from Pembroke. He, uh, he was only 16 years old. He joined in Pembroke Armories. My grandmother took him out because he was too young. He left and went to Renfrew. My grandmother made a decision that, well, if he wants to go in the Army that bad, we'll let him go. When he was going to be 18 years old, we got word that he had died, got killed. Uh, we had no idea where it was, uh, where he was buried. And just in the recent years, we found out where he was buried and his, uh, his name on the tombstone. And people from Kingston got it for us. My, since then, my mom and dad has passed, and my dad left me this because he knew that I'd be one of the 15, which there's 13 boys and two girls, and there was four of us in the reservists, and if there would have been something go on, we would have been gone too. But uh, they, I kept it up and joined the Legion, and uh, uh, dad left this for me. So it's a real privilege to have this, although it does bring back memories. It's called the Dead Penny and the lines on it because of British rule. This is the thing, the holder that my grandmother received with this in a hundred years ago. So it brings back real memories. Very, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because I was 17 years old in Holland when the war was over and we had been, Holland had been in that war since 1940, uh, that's five years. And we had been, uh, so being 17 in 45, I know a lot what happened in those five years. And the last year was very important to everybody in the country because that was the year that we were going to be free. And I, I say this loud and clear, it was the Canadians that made Holland free. Not because I'm here and, and you're Canadians, but it was, it was like that. And they have been fighting from the left side by the Xi up to Nijmegen. And then the war stood still. The whole winter of 44, the war stood still as far as. And I lived in the south, which was lucky, because I was free in September. Mm -hmm. And the rest, <coughs> till the rivers were free, but the, the, the rest was still under German occupation. And in those last months, the country, there was nothing to eat anymore. Not for us, we were free. But the rest, and it was the Canadians that end March 1945 went up and made the rest of the country free. And in, the, in those four months, five months, more than 10,000 Canadians died. That's just dying. And you know, uh, I can look back at that and, and 
I have the greatest admiration for Canada and for its people because we have definitely seen what you people were made for from. And we have definitely, when I came to Canada in 1952, I could choice between, uh, between uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand. I never had to think for one minute because I know, I know the Canadians, I know the people. And when I came here, uh, I have looked at, at this building as, as a, a church. And not many people have done that, I not have enough. Here, those people who came together and who had been three years away, four years away sometimes, and uh, when I looked in their faces, they looked in mine, and they know exactly what I talked, and they know what I talked from them and how they talked about me. And, and it clicked. And I sometimes they say, uh, Holland and Canada, that's all one. It is one, and it always will be one. And uh, there never will be a time that, that the laying of the reed will be forgotten by any Dutchman. What made me join was, I'd been up north in the bush and logging. I think we went up in October and I didn't come out till the 16th of March. I read the first newspaper and I come out and I saw where Korea was opening up, very strong at the time. So when I got back down to Barry's Bay, I saw a chap and I said, let's go and join the Army. So we hired a taxi from Barry's Bay to Ottawa, 150 bucks, but it didn't matter, we had the money. And I enjoyed, I was only in the three years, but I certainly enjoyed the three years, and I could never see, when I went over to Korea, on the boat that was 21 days over, why Canada was getting involved in Korea in a country that we just had come out of, and it was well stacked with everything you could think of, why would Canada want to get involved there? But belonging to United Nations, they had no other choice but help the United Nations out. I enjoyed myself very, very much. In fact, I traveled right across Canada and over to Korea and back in the three years, so I saw a lot. I met a few lads that were just about as wicky as what I was. <laughs> and that wasn't very good at times, but the beer tasted pretty good in Canada, but the sake wasn't too good in Japan. But other than that, I uh, found now that what has happened to me since I'm turning older, I'm starting to forget. Forget a lot of stuff, and uh, it's bound to happen. But uh, I think I'll still hold on. But uh, I certainly met a wonderful, wonderful bunch of chaps, and I'm still in contact with them. In fact, uh, one chap in Windsor, he's down in his bed, but I always phone him every Christmas, and he's quite happy. He thanks me a lot for phoning him. Uh, like I said, I really enjoyed and one thing that kept me away from marriage. I uh, <laughs> have to tell you this because I didn't get married the first time until I was 65. So I thought that maybe that's what it was that kept me away longer. <laughs> but I guess the right one come along at 65, so I... But other than that, no, I certainly enjoyed it and uh, I think I in interested about three or four while I was in well, I come back to go in, and they went in from the little country town of mine. <coughs> the 27 Brigade was slated for uh, Germany. They put us in, uh, in the Algonquin Regiment in Ottawa, shipped us down to Camp Borden for basic training, turned around, shipped us to Valcarci, Quebec, 
Valcarcio Terrain Raid Alberta, mountain climbing, got back to Valcarci, you're going to Korea. They took 55 men out of uh, our uh, battalion to go to Germany to replace the married men coming back in 53. So we got going to Korea and uh, the 50 men went to to Germany and my buddy that I joined with, he went to Germany, so he didn't get to come to Korea with me. But other than that, I certainly enjoyed the three years I was there. And one thing I liked about it, and I'll tell you, I liked to put the thumb up and hitchhike. I hitchhiked many of the times from Quebec City to Barry's Bay and had a nice holiday in Barry's Bay. I do a good drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was really good. That time they'd pick up uniformed pe people on the road, eh? Uh, I had a band for four years, and I got tired of playing. Uh, the nightlife was getting to me. And they had the SMPT course, Lanark and Renfrew. And they were paying $35 a week to be, and it was a six week course. So I went in and I learned how to march and that. And uh, I said, I'm going to join the Army. And that's what I did. I went, five of us from around here went down together. And uh, I had three openings. I had the Van Dues. They were going to send me there, but I couldn't speak French. He said, you are French. I said, I'm not. A, <laughs> not with the name of Jones. I said, I'm Welch. And I had the one RCR or the Queen's Own Rifles. Well, my brother-in-law was with, with Ambrose in, in the Korea, and he was wounded there. And he told me, he said, you're going to join, join one RCR. He said it's one of the best regiments, so I did. I joined in 62. I went to Germany and just got out of depot and right over to Germany, 62 to 65. Come back. I was stationed up in Ipperwash, back to the battalion, and first time Cyprus it was 67. And then in 69, I went back to Cyprus. And like he's saying, there's few things there that we've seen that it it gets at you, but you're in the army and and, and you keep it to yourself. Suck it, up. Suck it up. That's what we were told. Because if you started to anything, you were sent back home. So. Uh, when they were sending me back for the third time, I had a, uh, my wife said to me, if you go, I won't be here, so I got out. I did uh, 12 and a half years. I only had 12 and a half years to be pension off. I would have been 45 years old and full pension, but it was the best move I ever made was to get out. But my uh, 12 and a half years, I. I don't regret a bit of it because I learned. I learned a lot. Uh, uh, discipline was the first thing I learned. And the second thing is, like he was saying, you got a buddy, you work together. Teamwork. Teamwork is that what you were known as. Teamwork. And the guy beside you, you always depended on him, like he depended on you. And, like I said, I'd go back in again tomorrow if I could. My dad was Second World War vet. My grandfather was First World War vet. My uncle was in the military. He was Air Force. I had neighbors that were in the military. And one day I just said, this hunting for jobs, like everybody says, <laughs> like wandering around, making no money and not having a steady job. So it got quite interesting, so I decided, why not? So I joined. I go to the recruiting office. They gave me a bus ticket to Halifax because I'm from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Go for your medical, send me home for 
Christmas holidays, then they said, well, you got to be back here on the 1st of January. Okay, 1st of January is a blizzard. Of course, I'm a greenhorn and don't know nothing about the military. Show up on the 2nd. Sergeant looks at his watch. You're a day late. Well, what am I supposed to do? I can't <laughs> regulate the weather. And they shipped me off to Gagetown, Black Watch Depot. Did my basic training. Finished that, went into 1st Battalion Black Watch. Did an exercise that summer. That fall, I was shipped off to Cyprus, like everybody else here pretty well. Yeah. And off for six months. First month, I'm sitting on an outpost, and all of a sudden they said, well, you're going to work in an office. Well, I quit school because I hate paperwork. <laughs> so I, here I am sitting in, a, in an office with six or seven other people. What am I supposed to do? <coughs> well, you are now a draftsman. Well, I guess I can draw pictures. So I did, went with the eye office for a spell. And in April of 68, we come back to Canada, back to Gagetown, worked in the eye office. One day the regimental sergeant major walks in. He said, what, what do you think about going to Germany? I said, what's going on in Germany? He said, well, doing rotation. I says, who do I go to? Well, you're going to the RCR. So I went to... 2nd Battalion RCR, stayed there for two years, got into the paint shop, working with pioneers, sign painting. So all of a sudden they come out with the bright idea, they're going to form 3 Mech Commando. So what is 3 Mech Commando? They're a mobile organization, they're, they're air mobile. So they got the big parachute and and the wings, I'm painting a sign, and it says, you going to Airborne? I says, no, I'm not, I, I want to go back to Canada. So I come back to Canada, where am I going? Came here to 3RCR Petawawa. <laughs> come here to Petawawa, here I am off to Ottawa during the FLQ crisis that everybody worked at also. You know, like it was, it made an interesting, a very interesting, uh, concept of life because what did I know about drafting? What did I know about construction? Well, my dad's a carpenter. I know a little bit about it. So with the pioneers, you're doing carpentry, you're doing bridging, you're doing whatever. So it's, uh, it was a very good experience because different trades in civilian life, Right now, you need probably grade 12 and maybe one year of university for most of the stuff that I've done. Mm -hmm. Just grade 8 education off the street and into a trade that everybody else gets paid a fortune for, and we got by. Yeah. And I sort of enjoyed that. It was, it was an interesting <coughs> life. Then, of course, I decided, well, I could probably still serve after I got out. And I got out in 75 after eight and a half years. Did a year and a half with the Lanarkin Renfrew, Scottish, which is a good unit. And I was storeman for a while with them. And then there was no work around here. So I went to the Maritimes, got out of the Lanarkin Renfrew and never went back. But maybe I should have stayed but you do what you got to do to keep your family going. Uh, in 19, uh, all the time, in my time, there was no professional army. But when you were 19 years old, you had to go to the doctor locally, and he would say if you're healthy, and then you would get uh, called up, you had to join the army. And uh, in my time, that would be earlier, nine months. 
But then in my time, you were in Korea. So when I came there, the Netherlands had joined uh, NATO, and so I, I served right away with the NATO. And I had to stay every night at 5 o'clock like this, listen to you people trying to win hill number so much. It was all hills, and it was so, and we understood it, it was so difficult. They were fighting from hill to hill, and you know, uh, we had to listen to that. And so, uh, since that time was critical in, in Europe, I had to be in the army two years. Mm. And uh, I was an engineer, and uh, I have laid, I have placed bridges on every canal in Holland, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, on, 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 on every, on every uh, <laughs> river. And I look back at it, at, uh, it make me, I didn't like to go, nobody did like to go, but uh, it was, it, it made me a man, because over there they did not fool around with nobody, eh? You had to do what you had to do early in the morning and uh, extra things at night. So I got friends that uh, I have been often back to Holland and I have still two friends that I, every time we phone each other and we, we make it an afternoon, we play pool somewhere or we do something and uh, that's still, and the three of us were all 89 now. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Uh, uh, <coughs> the Dutch Canadian Club was born in 1969. And uh, the, in 70, Canada was uh, 25th anniversary. And we got with the Dutch Club, the Dutch ambassador here. And uh, he came with the Dutch flag on the front of the building. I don't know if any of you remember that. And uh, he, he had right away friends. His name was Engineer Bot. And I never forget, uh, we were getting ready for the parade here in front. And they, they didn't know where the ambassador was. And, and, and I went back in the hall here and I said, uh, you know where the Dutch ambassador went? Yeah, they said he's in that little room. He, he was in that little room there. And there were all those veterans at the bar already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> and they had, <laughs> you had a great time. And so, uh, since 1969, I have, uh, uh, I have been in the parade to the Zenata. Mm -hmm. So that's 50 years. And from those 50, the last 40, I have placed uh, the reed. And it's not who reads, who, who lays them. Uh, the thing is that he's going to be late. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can guarantee you that that time never will be over. Mm -hmm. When I am not here anymore, that reed, that reed is going to be laid on November the 11th. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I was 18 years old. And I couldn't find any work in Montreal. There was no work to be had. It was a, a kind of a, a real slowdown in the economy, I suppose. I wore out a pair of shoes looking for, for work in Montreal. But I think it was one of the best things I did <coughs> to join the Army was uh, because um, I, got, I, I went to school, but uh, uh, during school, I, I didn't seem to do very well. And I found out later I have dyslexia. So I, I went to school until I was 16 years old, and then I was kicked out. Um, I was in grade, uh, partway through grade nine. But when I joined the Army, um, things just blossomed for me because they have a different method of instruction. And it was suited me to a T because I couldn't read uh, very well, I didn't have to, because the, the way they instruct in the, in the Canadian Army anyway, um, it suited me in that I was able to learn. But the whole attitude in the Army is that you're gonna learn. 
you're not going to fail. And so, and you become, immediately you become uh, working as a team. You're never working alone. You're always working as, you know, a two-man team, a three-man team, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, um, and it goes that way right through the military. So I, I was learning and learning, and I just loved the military. It was great for me. So um, I joined because <laughs> I was looking for a job, but I'm really glad I did. Oftentimes, and, and a lot of people forget that peacekeepers face uh, many, many challenges. And um, we all see the same thing, whether it's a car accident or a, a concert or whatever, a little bit differently. And there were three episodes that happened to me in Cyprus. And all of them include, uh, uh, had to deal with death and dying. And um, I didn't realize it at the time, but it had affected me mentally. And uh, when I got back, even though I loved the Army, I got out about a year and a half later. Um, and I didn't know why until 2010 when I was diagnosed with PTSD. And that's when I looked back and there's all kinds of touchstones. You know, I was hospitalized with, uh, they thought it was a heart attack, but it, it wasn't, it was anxiety. I have to do with PTSD and anger and um, I was a binge drinker and stuff like that. So at first I thought, geez, that's too bad that I got out. But then I thought, no, it's good that you did get out because it would have got worse uh, being um, exposed to more uh, traumatic uh, events like Somalia or Bosnia or things like that. So um, I enjoyed my time in the Army. And since I've been out, the Canadian Guards uh, f um, are no longer. They were uh, disbanded. And, uh, but I've become very much involved with the Canadian Guards Association, as has Ambrose. Blair. When I first joined, we were told about November 11th. Without the Canadians and all the other countries fighting and won, if they wouldn't have won, we could all be speaking Japanese and German today. But November 11th to me is like I, like we were saying that we had people die while we were in that were friends of ours and that, and it's. For us is to remember all the sacrifice that that uh, the ones that didn't come home did for us. That's all I got to say. Uh, yeah, I had uh, two uncles in First World War, and I had great respect for them. But their two of their buddies were both killed beside them. And they had related that to me, and I really, from that day, I think, on, I had really, really wonderful respect for them. I think on my time already, I had an uncle. He got uh, a bomb on his house. That was number one, uh, three months before the war was over. I had, uh, I was at home, the, young, the baby from uh, nine kids. And so I had four brothers, and two of them were in the war in 1940 against the Germans. But that war lasted only four days. Mm -hmm. They ruined over it like nothing. Eh? So there were two. And then after, two sisters got, were married. And then them guys, they were in the Dutch army during the war. And you know, if you have been there five years, and if you have seen everything, uh, so I was 17 when it was over, but then you know 
that you can never forget that. And then, you know, if there is a day on November the 11th that they celebrate it, that they think about that, then you, there is no other places to go there and do that because it's duty. I think of all those when I stand there. And, and, and you know, uh, they, those veterans that I started to know in the Legion here, eh, they were beautiful people. They, when, when I sat in the Legion with them and they wanted to tell a story to me, and because they wanted to tell it to me, because they know that I know what they were talking about, mm -hmm. and, and that made that all, that never can get separate, and that, that's why you think, I think I have to be here on November the 11th. Uh, it's a huge. I think rem Remembrance Day is important, and since I've been with the color party since about, I don't know, 1998 or something, um, I've learned a little bit more about Remembrance and Remembrance Week. <clears throat> and it means something different to everybody. And so I've been able to take my focus, change it a little bit. I grew up, as most Canadian kids did, with uncles and aunts that were in the uh, Second World War and uh, heard their stories. Very, They didn't talk very much. But now that I'm old, or, you know, I'm older now, and I understand, I've changed that focus a bit. I think about the soldiers that are in now, and I remember them as well as the soldiers that I served with. I still remember them as well, uh, especially the chap that's still over in Cyprus. He died over there. Um, but we do the job every day. It's like our police officers and our ambulance drivers and uh, they do the job every day and like, for example, the government says, okay, we're going to send a group over to Central Africa or somewhere in Africa. Okay, so, you know, you're picked, you're picked and you load up your gear, you go on course and then you go over there. You know, that's part of the job. So for me, I remember those guys and gals that are, are, are going to be slated for those jobs. And I think about them when they get over there or at least on their way over there. And the same is in the Navy and the Air Force. Um, so that's how I changed my focus, and it's mostly because of the Legion and being with the, with the color party, uh, and visiting the seniors' homes as we do, and the schools. And um, uh, you can look at the kids sometimes when the speaker from the Legion is speaking about Remembrance Day, and some of them kind of get it. They don't all get it, that's for sure. There's some of them are too young. But some of them get it. And you hear some of the things that they comments they might make about soldiers. You know, they're kind of in awe. Uh, but it's an everyday thing. We, we do it every day. We do it constantly. And according to well, what we read in the papers and magazines from other countries, we do a pretty damn good job of it, too. I'm quite proud to be a, a member of the Canadian Armed Forces. A few years back, I was at the November 11th banquet, and I was sitting across a Second World War vet, and they were just chit-chatting back and forth, and all of a sudden they got the students giving their poems and speeches and whatever. And all of a sudden, I looked across the table, and here is this man, completely broken up in tears over, because he was re what she was saying was driving home his remembrance of what he had seen, what he had done, yeah. what he could have done, I mean, it's hard to say what the man was actually thinking. And I said to myself, like, I lost friends in Germany. Like, I remember how it affected me because you're working with these guys every day. And all of a sudden, like, they're not there no more. It's almost 
To me, it's almost like losing a member of your family. Like, you start thinking back to Remembrance Day of all the people that went over. And I mean, they were like all of us, all volunteers, to go to a foreign country and give up their lives for the safety of other people, I think that's a pretty big burden to put on your shoulders. And that's what I see about Remembrance Day. It's, it's a feeling that the people are out there saying, you know, like, why are these guys going over? Well, in their hearts, they feel they have to do their part to stop what's going on in the world today. And that's, for me, that's what Remembrance Day means. Education first. Yeah, I, that's my thing too, is, is <laughs> make sure you get an education and learn a little bit about what part of the Army or Air Force or Navy you want to go to so that you go in, not like we did, like this, just for a job, uh, but you want to look at it as a career. Um, and I think and I think you alluded to this earlier uh, about uh, you have to have a higher education now to do the job that we were doing mm -hmm. uh, before. Like, yeah. you know, you have a grade 9 education or a grade 8 education and you do all these things and now you have to have, you know, a college degree of some sort. So... Uh, Look into it first. Do a little bit of research. Don't just pick up off the street like we did. And, and uh, But it is a good career. It can and will, would be a good career for lots of people. I'd do it all over again if I could. I, I would too. Do it yeah. Yeah. For the money that I, was getting, I was getting $44 <laughs> every two weeks. Right. $88 a month. Yep. Yeah, we were driving Cadillacs. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I wasn't. I didn't get married till about a year or so before I got out, and uh, I was in Petawawa, and my parents were in Montreal. I used to. Somebody mentioned about hitchhiking. We used yeah. to hitchhike all over. I hitchhiked to Montreal quite a bit. Um, for me, my family was back in Petawawa. That was my my brothers and sis sister and mom and dad were were over there, and I was here with my buddies. Uh, but I knew guys that were uh, married and had kids, and that was a different responsibility, mm -hmm. for sure. It must have been. Well, for most of them, it was, yeah. Well, I had a stepdaughter that was very young when I met her mother, and it really hits home. Like, you go on exercise, you're going to Norway, you're going to Denmark, you're going to Germany, you're going here, you're going there on exercise and you come back home and you walk in and your wife says, Daddy's home, and the kid looks at you and starts screaming uh, that she's afraid of you, it sort of makes you think quite a bit. That's one of the reasons why that I got out at, when I did get out, because I'd come home. It wasn't, how long you home for, Dad? It was, when are you leaving again? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good life but it's a hard life in some aspects. Yeah. Like infantry is, is, is a, a, a trade that you're here today, you're gone tomorrow. So you take it with a grain of salt, either you put up with it or get out. I mean, there's, there's not much choice, but like maybe I should have stayed, maybe I shouldn't. Like I keep putting that in the back of my mind for the last... 40 years, so I'm still here, I'm still surviving. They, they have to show it to them, for the, it was them that went ahead and offered their time and everything to save them back. They volunteered their services to and a lot of them left families behind too, not, not married families, but brothers and sisters, eh? Mm -hmm. 
I know I did. I, I didn't leave any brother because I only had the one, and he was in there too, so the six sisters, though, we left behind. And uh, I remember my dad was uh, very, very strong. I don't know what happened to him in the time of the First World War, but I joined up in Ottawa and come home, and I said, well, Dad, I joined the Army. He says, yeah, you burnt your arse, sit in the blister. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what he told me. Yeah, but I did. I come back and I said to him, "Well, Dad, I burnt my ass." And I said, "The bl blister's busted now." <laughs> yeah, it's just in a jokey way. I yeah. didn't get into any <laughs> argument with him or anything. But um, I would certainly advise younger ones to go in. It's uh, the education end of it first to get and let them get the education then go in and they learn. There's a lot of experienced experience people in there and they'll, as long as they have their two years open, eyes open and don't answer back and you'll certainly get ahead. When we were in Cyprus, I was with the dance band. Like we formed a dance band between the pipes and drums and whoever could play music. And they asked us, you know, we'd like a dance band. So at that time it was Motown. That was the big thing. So we were playing for this wedding. And uh, anyway. There was a bunch of women there, and of course, there were, everybody's having a grand time. So, one of the one of the lads had an escort with him. So the lad was pretty well up in age compared to what we were, and probably, you know, late forties maybe. But everybody called him the old man. Eh? So this young lad goes up. He goes to the escort and he says, uh, do you mind, sir, if I dance with your daughter? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> put it this way, <laughs> the next day the poor lad had more duties than he could <laughs> afford to do. <laughs> but we thought it was pretty funny, like, you know, but the old lad didn't. <laughs> It was it was pretty hilarious, but <laughs> but you always find something like going on like that. There's always plus we had our mascot. I don't know if when you guys were there with the donkey, yeah, Charlie I, I Charlie McBurrow sitting on <laughs> sitting on parade. <laughs> they always had the mascot down at Onisha Farm, and of course this donkey likes eating cigarette butts. So the guy who's in charge of the donkey for the parade would fill his pocket full of cigarette butts, eh? Well, we were, at that time, we were just starting coming out with the combat gear. Of course, he's got his pockets full, and poor donkey ate all the cigarette butts while there was nothing left for the donkey to do, so he tried to mount the soldier. <laughs> and here's the sergeant major. Here's a sergeant major kicking the donkey in the gut and trying to get him off his shoulders. <laughs> it was a pretty hilarious thing. I was a photographer. I, I never got a picture of it. I was laughing too hard. Oh, my God. Uh, but there was a few things going on over there that was hilarious, but it, it never got recorded. What about you guys? Well, uh, <laughs> The most fun I had was uh, the year I was on the cross-country ski team, the biathlon team. Again, going back to where we were talking about young people joining, join because you're going to learn all kinds of stuff that you'd never learn on Civvy Street. You would, wouldn't have the opportunity, you know. But um, so I learned to cross-country ski, to race, and with a rifle strapped to your back. And I still cross-country ski today. And so, uh, but... It was fun doing that and learning it, 
But we also had to train the other guys, the infantrymen, on the bangy boards. Everybody remembers the freaking bangy boards. So we had to do that, but we skied pretty much five days a week, uh, at least three and a half anyway, and then we did the gym and stuff, and then did training with the other guys. But when you mentioned about uh, the being on parade and uh, a fun time, it was New Year's in Cyprus. And I don't know who came up with this idea, but it was going to be a sports day down in Camp, Camp Trudos, which became Camp Maple Leaf. And we had a Jeep and a trailer, and there were three of those big pots, you know, the big soup pots? Yeah. And we all guess what's in it is uh, moose milk. Yeah. Full of, the three of them are full of moose milk, and we're on a sports field. Somebody invented a game called Hakum. Did you guys ever play Hakum? No. Oh, I guess it didn't get passed on. <laughs> 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 it was too dangerous. Okay, so you know like a three-legged race? Mm. You tie your, so mm. you're on team A, I'm on team B. So we're opponents and we tie ourselves together. These two and, you know, six or eight guys on each team. So you, you got, and you got a broom and a volleyball and a goaltender there and a goaltender there. <laughs> like not as big as a soccer field. We didn't make it that big. Of course, we're all into the moose milk. And so you're trying to get down and, and score, but the guy beside you, he wants to score the other way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you'd see one of the guys, he'd go, bang! <laughs> and he'd have to drag Buddy with him <laughs> down the field because he just knocked him out. <laughs> and, and I don't know if anybody ever scored. <laughs> well, that went on, I think we had two games of that. And then the moose milk got distributed to the officer's mess and the sergeant's mess and the men's mess. And of course, everybody down again, drop another 40 into the. So that, that, was, a, that was a fun thing. Um, Hakum, I'll never forget that. I have to tell you first, when I was in the army, we had a, dull, a gold in a day, eh? because, and that was uh, seven a week eh? in 1949. Eh? And then the, you have to think about the camp was not a camp, it was a building with 100 boys in it, three rooms from 30. Eh? And then uh, at 7 o'clock, we could go out, but at 10 o'clock, we had to be dressed before the bed mm. or in the bed. Mm. And uh, one evening, we went to uh, play in pool, and it was 5 to 10. Eh? Uh, and and if you were not there, then the next Saturday you couldn't go home, eh? No. And so we had to be there. We come out of that, that little bar, and there were two women. There were three women, and we were the three of us, and we whistled, to, we whistled them. And <laughs> they came with a bicycle, <laughs> and we, we, there were women bicycles, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> we all had a women bicycle, and the girls were sitting on uh, the carrier with the legs cross <laughs> with that, <laughs> and we went all the way there to make it <laughs> to make it home before <laughs> ten o'clock, you know. And oh. that was all we wanted from those girls. That's yeah, that's all you want that night. Yeah. <laughs> 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 drive home. That was not their idea, actually, because oh. they asked us right away if they could see us next night. We went the next evening through the look through the window, and they were there, but we never went out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'll never forget the <laughs> over there in Korea. There, we weren't allowed to uh, have uh, have rum. All they'd give us was beer, but they'd only give us two pints apiece. So we watched when the beer truck was coming in, and we took a whole case. We turned around, there was three of us when turned around and drank the whole case and <laughs> broke the bottles up and buried them into the ground and the two officers in charge of the booze were running around looking for a case of beer. <laughs> <laughs> They're still looking. <laughs> They're still looking yet. The glass is in the ground there in Korea, yeah. <coughs> but we we didn't get any more rum anyway, and they certainly watched our camp that we didn't get any beer either. <laughs> they knew we had it, but and coming back 
uh, I'll never forget this one. After we got off the boat, they just tramped us right onto the train and out of Seattle, Washington, and we were asking the officers when they were going to stop and we'd have a walk around. Oh, you'll get out in Calgary. We'd walk around Calgary. And we had a chap from Calgary that knew that where we were going to be stopping. He turned around and he got off, got the taxi to get two cases of beer, brought them back. And <laughs> I grabbed one and the fellow behind me was grabbing the second one and uh, one of the officers that was with us saw it and he chased them. The lad just ducked it over to the, what they call the lucky man on the back of the train with all the cigarettes and chocolate bars <laughs> oh, yeah, and he yeah, hid yeah. it in his compartment. <laughs> <laughs> he watched that till midnight Two o'clock in the morning, we started at the Keisha beer, and we had it finished by, by four. <laughs> oh, the, the, these things, I mean, I can partially remember. <laughs> Funny thing, I love because I was, I was with transport all the time I was in, and all I did was go from place to place, but I, last five years of my thing, I was here in Petawawa on the plains teaching the militia. Well, we used to get lots of fun out of them. They, they come in with their, their, the new stuff, the remember when we come out for the, but they got all the old, oh, yeah. all the old gear. And the bugs would be eating them and they were wondering why we wouldn't, weren't getting eaten at all. Well, we had all the fly dope. They didn't get any. That was, that was the funniest thing for me. I was like, um, this comes up, of course, a lot in Remembrance Week, Remembrance Day, is remembering the soldiers that, that come home with invisible wounds, whether it's a peacekeeping mission or if it's a, you know, a hard-fought mission, but post-traumatic stress disorder is a real thing. Uh, I've experienced it. I'm, I do experience it. And uh, we have to remember those people and anyone that knows anyone that has PTSD or they think they have, try and get them to get some help. Because um, once you get the help, you know, the doors start to open up and, and, and the, the curtains pull away and, and you start to see things better. And uh, it means a whole lot. And there's some great help around. The Royal Ottawa Hospital in Ottawa is a, has some fantastic people. There's a special place for, for veterans at the back of the building. There's a special uh, building there that we can go into. And, uh, and the psychologists, psychiatrists that come up here to, to serve us, they're really good people. And Veterans Affairs over in the mall, a bunch of good people working in there too. They're, they're really number one as far as I'm concerned. Answer your questions, help you fill out forms. So, so for the vets that are um, out there still suffering, uh, come on home, we'll help you out. At the Legion branch, there are service officers here too that, that can help out. We have to keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, earlier you asked uh, who in the Army what to do. Uh, the cadets, I think, mm -hmm. are doing a tremendous good job when I, I watch them often. Uh, uh, any any parent that has a, a boy uh, or a girl, I don't know, they could let them join the cadets. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the boy itself would like to find out if he liked it or not. You know, that was a good start uh, to, to find out if he really liked it or not. Uh, and they're, uh, they're giving them an education. I have been here that the cadets were bringing around the food and all this and that, they were simple things. At the same time, it makes their, their head, it's using their head, and they think we're doing something. And that is an, an education already by itself, uh, mm -hmm. and a good education. For a model point, it's, 
and then maybe the boy likes it. And if he likes it, we need an army. Yeah. They need it in every country. Mm -hmm. And every country should be behind that, that uh, if they have, they have help, then they should be there to help too, you know. I'd, I'd just like to say one thing that I would certainly love to advise anyone 18 years of age and over to try out for three years and they'll get a lot of experience and a lot of way, a good way of living. You got good, and you meet certainly, certainly meet good friends. That's it. <coughs> Robert, I'm the same as Ambrose. I I think uh, like the, the militia and that. Uh, once you get into that for a young person, and the disciplines there, and they're starting to to learn things. Uh, if they don't want to go to school, the from there, it's the easiest place to get into the army is from the militia, because you're already trained. Mm -hmm. And and like he said, I think everybody should have an experience. Uh, don't have to be the two years or the, even a, a, a six week course, uh, just to give them the idea of being in what it is to the discipline that's that's the thing uh, because when we were in Amen. you don't talk back uh, nothing back then you didn't or you were doing fire pickets galore or <laughs> or uh, the kitchen duty i know one one week i peeled uh, i bet you 50 pounds 50 50 bags of potatoes i was from five o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night I know it, it yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it's like I said, it, everybody should have a, at least a, a chance to uh, see what, like our, we were talking about our militia that we, that we help mm -hmm. here, like uh, we help them, and if we want help from them, we, we just have to go and get it, and which is good, and, and I find the kids now, when they're in it, they're a lot more politer than than they were before. Like their the discipline is is good. <laughs>